Okay, so when we talked about waves in general, we, we mentioned the concept of interference. And this, this idea arose because if you have multiple waves interacting with each other in the same space and time, they can interfere with each other. Uh, because when, when we want to figure out the resulting wave, we simply add together um, the, 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 each of the waves, each of the, the wave functions uh, at that position and, and at that time. So we're going to take a look now at interference in the context of sound explicitly, just as it's sort of an example to see how, how uh, interference and how adding waves together can affect uh, something that we observe in nature. So the picture is this. Imagine that you have two speakers. And both of those speakers are emitting sound at the same exact frequency. If I draw the wave fronts, in this case we're going to have circular wave fronts that propagate outwards from each of these speakers. So remember, a wave front is simply, if you imagine a wave propagating outward and you just draw a line where the peak of that wave is, that's what we consider the wave front. So if we look at the wave front coming from the speaker on the left, we're going to have wave fronts that look like this, where we get one wave front propagating uh, through a, a specific point in time that depends on the frequency. So I have several wave fronts, and then if I draw the wave fronts coming off of this speaker, we'll make them blue. Again, these are the, the, the frequency of the, the sounds coming off both speakers are the same, therefore the wavelengths are the same. <clears throat> I'm going to have something like this. I'll try to make these approximately uh, with the same wavelength. All right, so here I have two interacting um, waves. One from the left speaker, one from the right speaker. What you can see is that if we were to look at the wave function for each of these waves at, at, and, and then compare that to and then added them together to get the, the resulting wave function at a, at a specific um, place or time, um, in other words, to get the, 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 uh, if, we, if we want to solve for the actual pressure um, at a position and time on, uh, somewhere on this, this, in this two-dimensional space, in this two-dimensional plane, um, we would see that the, the, the pressure would depend on um, how these two, the blue and the green waves, interact with each other. And what we would find is that if you looked at this pr particular position, or this position, or this position, etc., wherever these wave fronts are inter intersecting, we would see that, those, that, that the pressure at those points would, would constantly be a maximum, would, would reach very, very high levels. All right, not, not constantly, it would, it would be a maximum. Um, it would be much larger, twice as large, in fact, than, than the maximum of, of that, that we'd expect, the maximum pressure that we'd expect if we only had a single wave. Conversely, if we looked at the position sort of in between, where we have the blue wave, um, the blue wave front, this is the peak of the blue wave, intersecting with the trough, which is right in between the two peaks of the green wave. So at these sorts of locations, here, 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 etc., we'd find that at those locations, the <clears throat> we would see um, we would see no sound. In fact, because the peak the the peak of the blue wave is exactly canceling out with the um, the trough of the green wave. And if we let time go by here, so that these wave fronts propagate outwards, so the green ones propagate outwards this way, the blue ones propagate outwards in that direction, what we'd see is that at these locations where these these maroon dots are we would always have an exact canceling out of the blue wave with the green wave. Whenever the blue wave is, has a positive pressure associated with it, the green wave would have a, a negative pressure, negative pressure, um, meaning a negative a, a pressure that is perturbed in the negative direction from the, from the average pressure, if you want. And those two pressures would cancel each other out so that the pressure at these locations is constant. It doesn't ever change. And that means that if you had your, if you were sitting at this location and you could you could detect this, you would hear no sound at all, because what is a sound wave? It's a it's a fluctuation in pressure. So what we get here is we get um, uh, interference at different uh, in in different ways depending on the location that you happen to be sitting at. At these bright red spots, you will always have constructive interference, where the way where the sound that you hear sounds much larger than you'd expect if you were just had a single speaker. At these maroon spots, you would have destructive interference, and you would hear no sound at all. We could draw this in uh, another in another way. So let's let's sort of draw another picture, and we're going to make it a little bit maybe a little bit simpler. So we're going to look at it as a single wave coming from a blue source. So again, this is a sound wave. It propagates to some um, receiver. Think of it as your ear or um, or something like that, a microphone that can record the sound. All right, and then we're going to put another speaker. <clears throat> or an, another speaker that emits sound uh, right here. 
okay? And this, this speaker is going to emit a, uh, emit a sound wave, and that sound wave is going to have the exact same frequency, and so it's going to look like this, and like so. And so what our ear is going to hear, it's going to hear the sound coming from the blue speaker, it's going to hear the sound coming from the green speaker, and it's going to hear those two waves uh, being in phase. So in this case, we consider these two waves are in phase because the phase angle of these two waves, at least according to the receiver, is the same. Whenever the blue wave is at a minimum, the green wave is at a minimum. Whenever the blue wave is at a maximum, the green wave is at a maximum. Since these two waves are, are in phase, what we're going to see here is we're going to get something like constructive interference. And again, the sound that, that this receiver hears will be twice as loud. The, amp the amplitude of the wave will be twice as large in magnitude as either of these waves, um, either of those waves individually. <clears throat> now, I could draw another picture. So again, we'll go back to the green, or the blue, sorry, we'll go back to the blue speaker. Well, that's not blue. Try again, let's get blue. All right, so the blue speaker again emits the same, the same wave, and the receiver is at the same position. Again, we have a green speaker. It's going to emit the same frequency sound again. But this time we're going to move that green speaker over here. We're going to put it here, and we're going to turn those two speakers on at the same time, just like in this example. <clears throat> and now the picture is going to look like this. Right, so now what you see is that whenever the blue, as, as the receiver here, this wave is propagating to the right, the green wave is propagating to the right, the blue wave is propagating to the right. What the blue, what the speaker now here, or what the receiver now hears is whenever the blue is at a minimum, the green will be at a maximum. And whenever the green's at a minimum, the blue will be at a maximum. And when they're both, when the, when the displacement of the molecules or when the pressure is at its average value right here, they'll both be at the same value. In other words, if I added these two waves together, what I would get is a constant value. In this case, these waves are out of phase, Com completely out of phase, and the result is destructive interference. And we got this destructive interference, and the result of this is no sound at all being recorded by the receiver. We got this destructive interference by simply moving our speaker. All right, and so if we look at what happened here, we can quantify this system. And the way that we can quantify it is it, is it seems like in this system that the, the determining factor as to whether or not we get constructive interference or destructive interference is simply the difference between the distances traveled by each wave. We call this the path length. All right, so the green speaker, its wave traveled a distance of D1. The blue speaker launched a wave that traveled a distance D2 in this first case. In the first case, we have the, we have the situation where D2 minus D1, this is called the path difference, <coughs> is equal to, I can look right up here, and I can see it's equal to one wavelength, right? This is one complete cycle of the wave, so it's equal to lambda. <coughs> All right, now I can generalize that. I can say, okay, that could be 2 lambda, 3 lambda, etc. Any integer multiple. If this is the case, my two waves are going to be in phase, and the result will be constructive interference. <clears throat> and the resulting sound that is, is heard by the receiver will be larger than the amplitude of the sound. We'll have an amplitude that's larger than either of the either of the two waves individually. In the other case, when I have a path length, again I can draw it here, the green wave travels a distance D1, the blue wave travels a distance D2, <clears throat> if I have a path difference that's equal to some half integer multiple, so one half lambda or three halves lambda, five halves lambda, and so on and so forth, 
Now my two waves are going to be out of phase, and the result will be destructive interference. <clears throat> OK, so this is how we, we can have um, two sounds or more sounds interacting with each other to result in a sound that sounds larger, sounds louder than either than either of the individual sounds if, if they're all by themselves, or even if there is no sound at all. <clears throat> so we can actually make this slightly more complicated. We can do that in the form of uh, if we if we go back to sort of our original picture where we had two speakers. All right, so we have two speakers emitting the same sound. All right, so they're both emitting a sound at the same frequency, and they're separated by some distance. Call it 4.3 meters. And I position a receiver somewhere down here, sort of in line with the speaker on the left. <clears throat> and I put that speaker a distance of 2.8 meters from that speaker. So I can ask the question then, what sort of sound do I expect to hear? All right, I'm going to get, I know I'm going to hear a signal from the left speaker and I'm going to hear a signal from the right speaker. I want to know, are those two signals going to amplify each other? Are we going to have constructive interference? Are they going to cancel each other out? Are we going to have dis destructive interference? Or maybe is it going to be somewhere in between? So the, the, the thing that I want to know is, OK, what is the path length or the path difference? Because that will tell me if I'm going to have destructive or constructive interference. Well, I already know the path difference traveled by the wave propagating from the speaker on the left, that's simply 2.8 meters. So I just need to calculate the path length of uh, the speaker on the right, and that would be you know, this distance right here. <clears throat> well, I can figure that out using the Pythagorean theorem. D2 is equal to the square root of the, the, the two sides squared, 4.3 squared plus 2.8 squared. If I do that calculation, I'll find that I'll get one point or 5.13 meters. So I can actually I can calculate the path difference. So t, d2 minus d1, that's equal to 2.33 meters. Now if I know the wavelength of the sound coming off of these two speakers, I can determine if I'm going to have constructive or destructive interference. Right? So if I give you the frequency of sound for these speakers that's being emitted is 221 hertz. The speed of sound we know is going to be something about 340, we'll do 343 meters per second. So I can calculate the wavelength of sound. So my wavelength that is going to be equal to the velocity divided by the frequency, which is equal to 343 meters per second divided by 221 hertz, or 1.53 meters. <clears throat> All right, so my path difference is 2.33 meters. My wavelength is 1.53 meters. If I take the ratio of those two things, which is 2.33 divided by 1.55, I see that I get a ratio of 1.5. In other words, my path difference is a factor of 1.5 times the wavelength. So I have this half integer criteria. Right, the half integer, half wavelength criteria here. My path difference is some um, some integer divided by two times the times lambda. So what that tells me then is I expect to have destructive interference. <clears throat> I will hear no sound at all if I'm sitting exactly at this position. Now this is actually something that you can do. You can have two speakers that are hooked up um, to a signal generator that emit a sound at the same frequency and they leave the speaker in phase. The two, the two waves will leave the speaker in phase. And you can observe this. If you actually sit here, if you do a frequency of 221 hertz and if you sit 2.8 meters away from the speaker, you will hear, in theory, you should hear no sound. Now this is a little bit harder to do in practice. Why? Well. Because if we set this up, say, in a classroom, what we're going to hear is, OK, we're going to hear the sound coming from this speaker. We're going to hear the sound coming from this speaker. But then the sound coming from both speakers is going to bounce off the wall that's over here and then be redirected back to your ear and then bounce off the wall over here and so on and so forth. So you're going to get all of these sound reflections coming off the walls and the ceiling and the floor. 
and that's gonna those those reflections are gonna be waves that contribute to what you hear at this this point. So it could be really difficult to actually observe this in the real world, but it is something that you can observe. You will actually notice a difference if you stand right here and move a little bit closer, a little bit further away, or a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, such that the path difference changes from being 2.33 meters to something else. Or, all right, and you'll, you'll observe this interference. It's not perfect because of all the reflections, but it is something that you can actually observe. So another place that it's a little bit, another, another system where, where this, um, this sort of interference between sound waves pops up and is very, very useful is for musicians. And it arises in something that we, we consider to be what we call beats. Right? Imagine that you have some instrument. Well, imagine we'll just use a guitar. And a guitar will sound, uh, will play one string, and it'll sound a 110 hertz A note. Right, so that's the second string, the second lowest string on a guitar. And so if I want to tune that, tune that um, guitar string, I want it to be at 110 hertz. Well, one of the ways I can do this is use another string that I know to already be in tune, and I can sound the same note. Right? I, can still, I can use a, a different string that allows me to sound a, a 110 hertz A. So imagine plucking the, the, the E string, which is the lowest string on the guitar, um, but but hold, uh, but but putting your finger down such that it sounds off this A. So on one hand, I have a note that I know is an A. So it's the I'm, I'm using it to tune. I know I have a tune that's an A. Right? Imagine you could even use a, a tuning device that I know is sounding off this sound. And then I I pluck my A string on the guitar, but it's out of tune. So the guitar is actually sounding off something like 112 hertz. All right. So it's pretty close, but it's not exactly right. So what I get are two notes. All right, so I get one note that's 110 hertz, looks like this. We'll, we'll use uh, the green for the guitar. And then another note that's, that's really close, all right, but not quite, not quite at the same frequency. All right, if I draw this out a little bit, I'll try to draw this out a little bit further so we can really see what's going on here. All right, so this guy is now like so, and then eventually they're, they're like this. So if we look at this this wave, these two waves, and the resulting wave in two different places in, in, in a variety of different places here, we'll notice something interesting. If I look right here at this wave, so imagine that this is a wave propaga propagating in time. So I'm I'm, I'm in a fixed location and I'm hearing these two waves, um, but this as I look uh, to the right here, this is time. So we're looking at the time axis. Time is to the right. So at this instant in time, these two waves are in phase. And so this, the resulting sound is going to be very loud. All right, remember, these are very, very close in, in um, frequency. So the, the pitch that of these notes is going to be very, 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 very close. And in fact, the pitch is so close that it might be impossible to actually differentiate between the pitch, or it's very hard to differentiate between the pitch. So I listen and I notice that right here at this, at this instant in time, the sound is very loud. But if I wait just a, a few moments, I notice a little bit later that, oh, right here I've got destructive interference, so the sound actually is, is very quiet because the two waves are canceling each other out. Here I have constructive interference, so it's loud. They're amplifying one another. Here, destructive interference, so now the sound is quiet. And then I go a little bit further and I wait, and I didn't draw this perfectly, so it doesn't look, I, it doesn't look exactly right, but I wait a little bit longer, and then down here again, oh, they're now they're in phase again, so now I get a loud sound. So this is the idea of what we call beats. What we're hearing is if we let this go is we're going to hear the sound go loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet. And the result in, in that, what that tells us is that the two notes aren't exactly in phase. The two notes aren't sounding, aren't exactly at the same frequency. The, the relationship between the phase of the two sounds, the phase of the two wa waves is changing as, as a function of time. And so we can use this to then say, okay, well, I know that this note isn't correct, I need to change the frequency. So I'm going to change the, I'm going to adjust the frequency so that I get rid of these beats. And so I eventually want to end up with something where the two waves are both, they both hold the same phase relationship. All right, so they can look like this. In this case, they're both in phase, but that's not necessarily what has to happen. But they at least they hold the same phase relationship. In this case, I would never hear any beats. The sound would be consistently loud. All right, it would always, as a function of time, it wouldn't change. Um, the amplitude of the sound wouldn't change. 
And that when that happens, I know that I've, I'm in tune. The, the way that I go from here to here, so slightly out of tune to in, tone, in tune, is as I tune my guitar ever so slightly, I'll notice that the beats, the, the, the time it takes to go from loud to quiet gets longer and longer and longer. All right, so as, as I tune my guitar, the, the, the time between each successive beat will be larger, and eventually I'll be in perfectly in tune and I will no longer hear any beats. So this, using beats to tune instruments is, is very common. We do this for guitars, pianos, whatever. If you tune any instruments, you're going to use this technique. This is a, or it is a technique that you can use. All right? and, and you'll notice, though, is that as we get further and further, as the two frequencies get further and further apart, you don't hear beats anymore. You simply hear either two different tones or some combination of the two different tones or something like that. So you don't really hear beats. You just hear two distinct tones, really. But as you get closer and closer together, when it gets very, very hard to tell the difference in the, in the pitch of, the, uh, of the, the two notes, now that's when the beats start to take over. You start to hear those, those beats, the oscillation of the, of, the, of the amplitude of the sound, and you know that you're getting really close. And you can use that to get you into perfect tune. All right, so this is just one example of where interference pops up, at least in the, in, uh, in the context of sound. You'll see many more examples of interference when we talk about light. As I mentioned before, um, interference with light is a very important phenomenon that has led to a lot of important discoveries um, as to the nature of, of the way that the universe works. A lot of very counterintuitive, uh, a lot of, of counterintuitive um, discoveries. So it's very, very important and you'll come back to that in the next semester of physics.